Acts chapter 16 and verse 16. Acts 16, 16. The first we in the verse refers to Dr. Luke, the author of the account, Paul, Silas and Timothy. Remember that motley mission crew? Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. From this 16th verse, and eventually, Lord willing, by the end of the month, all the way down to verse 24, I'd like for us to think together about the mysterious subject which comes up quite often in Scripture, and that is the subject of possession, uh, demon or, or, or spirit possession. And we're certainly not going to render this subject not mysterious today or or any other day because it absolutely is mysterious. It's mysterious because like other subjects, the Bible simply reports possession as a fact without really explaining a whole lot about it. It's one of those uh, biblical topics which I sometimes say uh, Scripture exclaims but doesn't really explain. The original recipient of the book of Acts and the gospel accounts were well acquainted with demon possession. They were well acquainted with demon-possessed people. It was something which was a part of their context. So those human authors who wrote the books of the Bible, I don't think really felt the need to explain how demon possession works if they even knew. But they certainly reported it as being a well-known fact of life. So it is mysterious. But hopefully our consideration of the passage before us this month will um, make it at least a little bit less mysterious and, and more importantly, I think we'll derive a lot of benefit and instruction along the way. Now, let me say this before we jump into this, what amounts to, isn't that great? Happy New Year. Let's talk about demon possession all month. Not, I didn't choose it. We're just working through the book of Acts. Um, but having... Studied and prepared, I believe it's going to be a blessing to us. Now, before we jump into it, I want to say that we're, we're just looking to see what the Holy Spirit teaches us of this subject in this passage, verse 16 down to verse uh, 24. We are not trying to do a, a systematic theology study of the topic. You can do that on your own if you want, if you, I, and I hope you do. Pick up a good systematic theology book. Uh, start maybe, if you're feeling ambitious, uh, start with uh, Charles Hodge and, and read through his uh, systematic theology. Uh, get to Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion. Uh, get to um, John Gill's complete body of, how is he titled it? Complete body of doctrinal theology or something like that. Um, uh, get to James Boyce's uh, abstract of systematic theology. Uh, if, if all those dead people are are distasteful to you, get to Wayne Grudem's systematic theology. He's still alive, so you can get mad at him if you don't like something uh, he writes. And look at what scholars say, if you want, about the overall biblical testimony regarding possession generally. 
but what we're going to do is get what we can with the help of God, the Holy Spirit, about possession from this particular passage specifically, verse 16 down to verse 24. And I think that we will learn something of the problem of possession, the partnership with possession, the power over possession, the profit from possession, and I don't mean P-R-O-P-H-E-T, the P-R-O-F-I-T, and the persecution which comes to the church from the possessed. That's our game plan for the month of January, starting today with verse 16 and the problem of possession. I see at least three things in verse 16 which makes possession problematic. Beginning with letter A, it's spiritual. Possession is a spiritual problem. Verse 16 specifically says the girl is possessed by a spirit. I think every translation uses the word spirit. It is the very uh, common to some of you Greek word pneuma. The literal meaning of the word pneuma is a current of air or a uh, more specifically a breath blast. So she is possessed, is this girl in verse 16, if you will, by a, a wind, a whispering, a breath of life. And it's a spiritual life. This is so problematic, brothers and sisters, because so many people don't even believe in a life or, or, or a force or an intelligence that they cannot see. Or, 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 or many, I'm convinced, claim to believe in such things, but deep down really don't. And their lives bear witness of that. You know, John 3, 3 teaches that without the new birth, a person cannot so much as even see the kingdom of God. That's because the kingdom of God is a spiritual reality. And it requires spiritual sight. It requires a, a, a spiritual sensibility to even so much as see it. And the natural man, the person who has not been born again, the person who's not been regenerated, 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, such a one cannot discern that which is spiritual. So many, many people who will tell you, I'm not religious, I'm just spiritual, absolutely are neither. They are natural. So the idea that one can be possessed by that which is a pneuma, a wind, a, a spiritual life force, something which is supernatural is a far-fetched idea to many. And brothers and sisters, one has no defense against something of which one has no discernment. Ephesians 6.12 says the Christian wrestles against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly, meaning spiritual places. Christians do that. Well, those who are not Christians, brothers and sisters, have just as much to do with the spiritual host of wickedness, but they don't discern it, so they don't defy it. They don't wrestle they don't resist. It's one of the main problems of possession. It's spiritual. And let her be, it's satanic. It's satanic. Verse 16 says, this spirit is one of divination. Divination. But the Hebrew word translated divination here is the word, listen to it, puthon. It, the, the, the accent's on the first one, so puthon. Puthon. And I'm pronouncing it, normally I wouldn't, because I'm from southern Indiana, and we don't do well pronouncing Hebrew. Um, but the reason I'm pronouncing it is I want you to hear the English word that comes from it. So, so, so the Greek word, did I say Hebrew? The Greek word is, it's puthon. Young's literal translation says she's possessed by a spirit of, here's the, here's the English, python. Python. Now, Marvin Vincent, Greek expert of the 19th century, explains. Python 
in the Greek mythology was the serpent which guarded Delphi. According to the legend, Apollo descended from Olympus in order to select a site for his shrine and oracle. Having fixed upon a spot on the southern side of a mountain, he found it guarded by a vast and terrific serpent, which he slew with an arrow and suffered its body to rot. So, okay, this is pretty fascinating. And, and we look to the Holy Spirit for an explanation, and we actually find it as given through the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians 10, 19. Paul asks this question. Is an idol, and, and, and the Greek mythology stuff falls into that category, idols. Is an idol, Paul asks, anything? Does an idol have any legitimacy? And he's already answered that question back in 1 Corinthians 8, 4. And the answer is no. An idol is actually nothing. However, here's what happens. Paul continues to explain this in 1 Corinthians 10, 20. When one in some way worships an idol, which is nothing, like Apollos or, or like this uh, mythical python that the legend has him killing when one in some way worships that which is not God in Christ that one is actually worshiping demons so demons it seems are are cunning to take up the identities of false gods and this is confirmed by Deuteronomy 32, 16, and 17. I'll give you a moment just to look upon that. Deuteronomy 32, 16, and 17 confirms that, that demons take up the identity of idols. And also Psalm 106, 36 through 38. And church, we have no reason to suspect that demons don't still do this. So if we today in various ways worship the idol of entertainment or the idol of politics or the idol of some politician or the idol of political power, if we today in various ways worship the idol of money, the idol of youth, the idol of sport, the idol of accomplishment, the idol of self, then the Holy Spirit through Paul says we are unwittingly giving worship to demons who take up those identities. So it's likely that at some point this girl has gotten involved in some way with idolatry in the context of Greek mythology and the identity of the fake god she worshipped has been assumed by an actual living demon. And we know Satan is the prince of the power of the air, Ephesians 2.2, 2, and that he has... Angels. He has spiritual messengers which are described in Matthew 25, 41 as his. That is, that is in some way they belong to him or are under his rule at least for now. So brothers and sisters, make no mistake, possession is problematic not only because it's of a spirit, but also it's because it's of the Satan. It's satanic. That's letter B. More on that shortly. For now, let's move on and observe that possession is letter C. It's slavery. It's slavery. Our verse says, verse 16 says, this is a slave girl. Now, that means She's been enslaved by evil men. This, this is straight up human trafficking before we ever put that title on it. That's what it is. This girl has what verse 16 calls uh, masters. Or as at least one translation calls it, owners. Owners. Either way, it's a translation of a Greek word which is often translated Lord. And its literal meaning is controller. And so this poor girl has been abducted 
by wicked men. They've taken ownership of her. They have assumed the position of Lord over her and they control her. They use her for their profit, which we'll talk about next time. There's, that's our P-R-O-F-I-T. They use her for their profit unto her harm. Human trafficking. She is a slave of wicked men. But church, she's a slave in an even more profound and wicked sense before these men enslaved her. She's possessed spiritually by a spiritual wickedness. The Greek word translated possessed here is used, lest you think this this kind of sermon series is irrelevant. This word is used 800 times in the New Testament. Ish. And it gets translated with the word have most of the time and hold sometimes. So what's going on? An evil spirit has this girl and is holding her. And not in any kind of good way either, but in an enslaving way. So by the very definition of the word, you see, this kind of possession is slavery. It is spiritual slavery, which gets manifested in having and holding, meaning, brothers and sisters, it gets manifested physically as well. It is a spiritual truth, which gets manifested physically too. Church, our feelings toward this girl... Our thoughts of this girl ought to be the feeling and, and thought of sympathy. Certainly for how she's being treated by men. But even more profoundly, how she's being treated by Satan and the spirits which serve him. And, and there's nothing in scripture which would would lead us to believe that these spirits serve their master in, in any way but willingly. And so here we have the problem of possession. It's spiritual, it's satanic, and it's slavery. But we're about to observe that it's even worse than you're thinking right now. The gospel accounts are packed with references to this kind of possession, as in over 60 such references. What I mean is, yes, the words used 800 times, but the gospel accounts talk about it specifically like 60 different times, different scenes in the gospel accounts. Some you can think of right now regarding people who have been or were or are possessed by these spirits. The very first miracle performed by Jesus as recorded in Mark's gospel account is in fact of Jesus telling unclean spirits who are possessing a man to be quiet and come out of the man. And, and the spirits uh, convulse the man and they cause him to cry out and the spirits, of course, obey Jesus and they come out of the man, Mark 1, 25 and 26. And, and, and so on throughout the gospel accounts. Over 60 more times such events are chronicled. So what I'm telling you is it's very prevalent. It's very prevalent in our New Testament, which makes our study of it very relevant. But it's even worse than you're thinking now. Because the problem of possession is not only spiritual, it is not only satanic, it is not only slavery, it's also, letter D, totally saturating. Saturating. It's, as the definition of saturated implies, it's full with the maximum amount possible. Meaning, dear church, Possession is ultimately, listen carefully to this sentence, possession is ultimately the lot. How saturating is it? It's ultimately the lot of every single person ever born into this world except Jesus Christ. 
And I use the words born into this world very purposely because 1 John 5, 19 says the whole world, the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. The whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. He is the wicked one is by God's decree for now in the words of Jesus recorded in John 14 30 he is the ruler of this world and to be under his sway brethren the word sway is I think it's a poor translation you can look it up in your concordance like I did the word sway is an attempt to explain the position of everyone who is of the world instead of of God by way of the new birth. And the word sway is used to try and explain a very, very simple Greek word actually meaning in, just in. So every person born into this world is born, if you will, in the wicked one. You, you, you think the idea is terrible of, of Satan or a spirit of Satan being in a person? What about the truth that a person is in Satan? It is the ultimate possession. It's, it's saturating to the point, Paul explains in Romans 6.16, that everyone born into this world is a slave to sin. That's our original lot, all of us, by nature. A slave to sin. Now, I want you to think carefully about that. Every person in the world who is still of the world, every person you personally know who has not been born again is a slave to to sin. They are under the sway of the devil. Every person you know who's not been born again is a slave to sin under the they they are possessed. If if possession is is spiritual and satanic and slavery, then every person who has been born but not reborn is possessed. I want you to think about the truth expressed in Romans 7. I don't know if I... Adrian, did I give you all of Romans 7, 14 and forward? Or are we turning there? Okay, it'll, it'll go forward from there. You got 14, 15, etc.? Okay, turn to Romans 7 then. Everybody, everybody turn, turn, in, turn your Bible to Romans 7. Thank you, sweetheart. I have argued, I trust from Scripture this morning, that every person who has been born but not reborn, meaning they're in this world and they are of this world, they are possessed. They are possessed. Satanically possessed. Romans 7, 14. Think about this truth here. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I'm doing, I don't understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it's good. But now it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I don't find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. That's Romans 7, 14 to 19. Sold, look at verse 14. Sold there in verse 14 translates a Greek word meaning, are you ready for this? Trafficked. That's what it means. 
trafficked, and then disposed of. Which is what, is what a trafficker does, right? Profits from a person, and, and then when they are finished with the person, they dispose of the person. Brothers and sisters, the problem of possession is saturating. It, 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 it is all around you. It's universal as far as those who have not been born again. And so let me ask you, and I already know some of these answers because you're no different than me. And that is, do you feel anger at lost people sometimes? Do you feel disgust? Disdain? Are you, as we will sadly hear Luke tell us later in the passage about Paul, are you annoyed by people who are not born again? We're going to hear that sad revelation next week. Luke's going to tell us Paul gets annoyed at the girl. Or, or has God by His grace sanctified us yet to the point of feeling overriding sympathy for them, for all those who are not born again, no less than the sympathy we feel for this poor girl in our text. I mean, listen, when we refer to lost people, when we refer to people who are still of the world, how often do we use the adjective poor, those poor people? If we're thinking right, that's how we're going to be thinking no less than we would think that about this poor girl. Now, next week, when we get to verse 17, we will see and celebrate the power over possession, praise the Lord. But it's enough today to become more conscious of the problem of possession. And it's a problem of yours if you've not been born again. It is a problem of yours if you've not been born again. And it was once, it was once a personal problem for us all. And, and again, we'll get to the power which must be brought to bear on a person to free them from possession. But I just think it's important that we don't get to it right away in our thinking? Because if we don't think carefully about the problem before jumping right to the power, then, then here's what's going to happen. We're going to have a problem with people. We're going to have a problem with people. Church, listen, please. People need us to not have a problem with them. They have problems with us. We can live with that. We, we were all once in the same position. But let's work hard not to have a problem with them, but rather let's be in pursuit of them, in pursuit of their deliverance. Let's refuse, please, to wrestle against them. Let's refuse to hate them. Let's refuse to, to dispose of them out of our influence. Say they're too much trouble to deal with. Everybody loves to use the word toxic now, right? Oh, they're toxic. Got to get them out of my life. What chance do they have if every Christian does that? Instead... May we, by God's sanctifying grace, use the weapons of our warfare given to us to wrestle for them. To wrestle for them against that which possesses them. Again, Ephesians 6.12. We know from 2 Corinthians 10.4 that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Church, let's pursue people by praying for people and proclaiming to people the truth. 
and by performing for people good works unto God's glory and their good. Last sentence. Will you hear it? Lost people have a problem. Let's make sure it's not us. Just stand and we'll close.